starting. There we go. So thank you uh, very much for everybody who's joining us again here at ID24. Uh, next up uh, in our schedule, we had a slight re-jiggle uh, of uh, the talks. Next up, we have uh, Shwetan Dixit, who's the Head of Accessibility Innovation at Barrier Break and a former colleague of mine when we worked at uh, Opera together. And Shwetan is going to talk to us about uh, accessible smart cities, the way forward. And as ever, if there's any questions or comments, please uh, put them on Twitter on the ID24 hashtag. And without further ado, uh, take it away, Shwetan. Hello. Um, yeah, great to, great to be here. And thank you for having me uh, at ID24. Um, it's it's really really great to to hear some thoughts. Um, so this this talk is about accessible smart cities, um, and what I think is being done around the world, and as well as what should be the way forward. Um, so let's start with a little bit about me. Let's just just get this out of the way. Um, so. Um, of accessibility, innovation, and research at Barrier Break. Apart from this, um, I'm also a member of a few W3C groups, in particular the AG Working Group, which is working on the next version of WCAG. Um, before this, as Patrick said, I used to work at Opera, um, where actually me, uh, Patrick, as well as Henny, uh, were at there uh, at some point in time. Um, in the developer relations team, uh, I was also uh, the PM of the extensions team over there for a while. Um, over here at Barrier Break, uh, I'm doing stuff where we're, I'm trying to take a look at how we can use technology to make the world a little bit more accessible. It is based in Mumbai. It's a it's a pretty interesting company. It's very 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 great because. Um, it's an enterprise, but it also has a social mission. Uh, what it does is, you know, uh, it does accessibility auditing and testing. Uh, it does a lot of uh, training as well, innovation of uh, people um, with disabilities, you know, and and try to make sure that uh, web accessibility is taken seriously. Um, it was one of the pioneers of web accessibility awareness in India. Um, we're hiring quite a lot, and uh, the, the percentage keeps uh, varying a bit, but about 70% uh, to 75% of our employees uh, have a disability of some kind, uh, which ties into the social mission that we have uh, as well. For all, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a place where we're doing, or at least we're hoping to do a lot of good um, for, for that particular part of the world. Um, so uh, let's get started. Uh, before we do, though, uh, a little bit about this talk and what it's supposed to be um, about smart cities. And even though most of the stuff that I'll be talking about would be uh, accessibility specific things, but not all of it would be accessibility specific things. Some of them will be a little bit more generic, a little bit more general as well. I'll be talking about mainstream implementations, but at the same time, uh, since a lot of these things are a bit cutting edge, uh, some of these things are a little bit more experimental in nature as well. So I'll be talking about things which are pilot projects as well as things which I've identified as gaps, things which could be done better. Um, uh, since I come from a part of the world which is a developing country, and since most of the stuff that I'll be talking about and most of the examples that I'll be talking about will be uh, for, from you know, developed countries, I'll chime in uh, with the developing countries' perspective. So if we're going to take a look at what other countries are doing, and then we'll see, OK, how would, how would this be relevant in a developing country's perspective uh, as well? What is that this, this talk will not really be about code. Um, there'll be some jargon and there'll be some terms that I'll mention, but uh, we won't really be talking about code. It's going to be more about ideas and inspiration uh, and seeing what we can do in the way forward. And uh, yeah, um, let's start. 
So um, to a smart city, it's a very vague thing. Um, the Indian government, uh, they, they announced uh, something called the Smart Cities Mission, which they, in which they um, 20 cities across India, and they said they're going to make it into a smart city. So I said, okay, let's just go to their website and see oh, what exactly do they mean by a smart city. And even on their website, they say, uh, the, they mention the fact and they acknowledge the fact that you know, the term, the smart city, is a little bit of a vague term. It could mean different things to different people. Um, some people uh, might see it as a purely municipal thing in which they just are obsessed with building codes and making sure that they, they're you know, proper. Um, whereas some other person, like if you ask a person on the street what a smart city is, they might have a very Star Trek kind of a version of you know, uh, you know, what, a, what the future might hold. Um, the, the reality is somewhat in between. Um, so research on what exactly are people doing when it comes to smart cities, the more I realized that I needed my own definition of what it actually means. And uh, what I found was it works for me, which is basically cities which are improving urban living by applying clever use of modern technology. This, this, this kind of um, definition actually works quite well for pretty much all smart city initiatives that I'm seeing. Um, and in fact, it actually works for uh, cities, uh, even you know, in, in, in history. Like for example, this is not really a new concept, smart cities. Um, if you really think about it, you know, throughout history, we've been employing technology in a clever way to improve urban living, you know, right since 5,000 years ago. Uh, in the Indus Valley Civilization, for example, we had, you know, th those were the first civilization to use modern, plumb you know, plumbing techniques and having flush toilets and stuff like that 5,000 years ago. So they were they were using the advanced technology, the cutting technology, cutting edge technology of that time to improve urban living. In 1882, we street station, which was the first modern, uh, first um, power plant uh, in Manhattan, actually. And before this, we didn't really have electricity as such. Uh, and after this, whenever we want to talk about cities, electricity is just thing which is taken for granted. So the cutting edge technologies which are improving today will just be taken for granted tomorrow. Which means that we really need, need to get this right because if we have inaccessible um, cutting edge technology today, that will be inaccessible technology which is taken for granted tomorrow and then it's going to be really hard to change it. So going back to our definition, um, there are certain things which are kind of implicit in it. In technology, what do we mean? We mean things like networks. We, need, uh, we mean sensors, application websites, um, modern engineering practices, um, as well as things like uh, AI, machine learning, computer vision. And when it comes to urban living, what we really mean um, over there, one of the things which is implicit is accessibility. It really is. Why? Because of the UN Sustainable, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are about a bunch of 17 goals over there. Goal number 11 has to do exclusively with cities. So um, let's make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. There are a bunch of different goals over there. I won't mention all of them, but there are a few which need emphasis. First, it says, by 2030, provide access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport systems for all. And the second says, by 2030, provide universal access to safe, inclusive, and accessible green and public spaces in particular for women and children, older persons, and persons with disabilities. So as you can see over here, when it comes to cities and when it comes to making smart cities, it, uh, the, the, the needs of people with disabilities has to be considered 
um, if you go by the United Nations. Very, very important. Smart cities will have a dramatic effect on the digital divide. It can either be a dramatically positive effect, dramatically negative effect. If you have an inaccessible smart city, it is significantly widened digital divide. If you have an accessible smart city, then you'll have a significantly narrowed digital divide. And World Enabled, they did a survey about, of about 250 uh, people involved in smart cities. Eight of them said that smart cities are failing PWDs, or people with disabilities. Not just, you know, it's, it's not just that, you know, they're, they're not optimal. They're failing people with disabilities. This is a big, big thing because you have a city which is using technology in an inaccessible manner. Once it becomes mainstream, then that's it. It's very difficult to change it. So let's talk about the various aspects when it comes to smart cities technology. Um, one of the first things that I want to talk about, and this is one of those general things, uh, is network infrastructure. Talk about it is because this is the base uh, for, for almost all modern smart cities. You need a good, decent, robust network infrastructure because of a modern smart city nowadays. Um, one, you need a proper fiber optic network because if you don't have that, you cannot really have good, um, good communication, good ICT. Um, you cannot really have good ICT over copper lines. You cannot have good ICT over dial-up or slow connections. You need faster connections. And you also need things on, on the mobile side, like 3G and LTE or 4G. So let's take an incident which, which adopted fiber in a very, very big way and saw a lot of gains. So Sweden, um, when they rolled out their fiber implementation, they saw a clear link between fiber and socioeconomic development. Some municipality uh, council reduced their communication costs by 50%. But what was even more interesting was the fact that in depopulated areas, the number of firms was installed. Also, the property value of buildings which were connected with fiber increased. So you can see how just introducing fiber can make a difference to the local economy. And this is kind of like the basis of what we're talking about. A great fiber optic network can really make a big difference. I was recently um, in, a, in a city talking about smart cities with the local municipal corporation over there. And they're a city which is in a part of India which is a little bit um, disconnected from the mainland. Uh, they don't really have very great, because of the geography that they have, uh, they don't really have that great um, road connectivity with the rest uh, of the mainland, as well as um, you know train connectivity or rail connectivity. So one of the things that I talked to them was in telecommunications and to invest more in infrastructure, because that can really bridge the gap. So when it comes to cities, there are various aspects that you have to consider. Health and safety, roads and traffic or navigation in general, facilities and services. You have airports, buses, railway stations. And we'll take a look at a few key aspects of all of them. Let's take a look in Montreal and what they're doing when it comes to navigation. Um, doing is they're using cameras and computer vision and machine learning to, to detect common things on, on the road, like detecting potholes and sick trees. Um, that's great. But one, one thing that in particular that they're doing really well is uh, an app called Otter, which uh, is from McGill University. And what they try to do is, what they position the app as, is neon signs for the blind. What it does is it aids visually impaired people to know what's around them. That's the, that's the whole um, point of the application. 
So how does it work? It uses data from Google Places, Foursquare, OpenStreetMap, 490 transportation agencies in Canada, and a few others. The person is supposed to open the app, walk around, uh, and have um, their phone connected via bone conducting uh, headphones. It provides ambient audio as visual cues, and it uses spatialized audio. So if a person is near a bar, and the bar is, say, in the front left, then it will say bar, but the, the, the voice will seem like it's coming from the front left. It will know instantly and instinctively to turn left. So th this is actually really, really great. From a developing world perspective, this is something which really is interesting. Obviously, in the developing world, have a little bit more of a pothole problem than the developed world. So using cameras and machine learning uh, and computer vision to detect potholes is actually pretty nice. But also using an app like Otter to give real-time status on closed roads, one-way traffic, construction work, that's going to be a godsend because in the developing world, especially, well, it's developing. You'll find, especially in cities like Gurugram in India, just out of the blue, a, a road is closed because of construction or some accident or something else. Sometimes roads are just marked one way. Um, and sometimes they're just one way for a certain amount of time, like, for example, between 5 and 7 PM. Having a, one, but one thing that developed countries in general have is a lot of people, which means you, you can have a good amount of crowdsourcing, which can give updates in real time on which roads are closed, which roads are open, um, which roads are one way. Um, so getting that kind of crowdsourced data in, in developing countries is going to be a little bit easier. Um, Google Maps is doing really great work in India, especially uh, where if you, if you contribute to Google Maps and you, if you put in data on you know, which establishment uh, is where, then it also asks you which establishments are wheelchair accessible, which bathrooms are re re wheelchair accessible, which is really, really great. One more app. Um, it's, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I, it's G J A C C E D E dot com. Um, just said, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so um, this website is really, really great, uh, especially for people in developed countries. Just put in uh, the city you want to visit or city you are in, and you have a bunch of custom filters. You wanted to see the establishments in New York, which had full wheelchair access. You can just select, select that from the filter, and it'll give you uh, and list on the map have full wheelchair access. So this is really, really great. It has a lot of good information for cities like New York, London, or you know, in, in, in cities like that, which are in the, in, which are a little bit developed. Uh, but when it comes to developing countries, right now the information isn't really that accurate. Uh, I entered Delhi, and over there I couldn't really find anything. So it kind of is hit and miss. But if you're in a Western developed country, it actually is pretty pretty great. So you can just check that out. One more project, um, which the University of Maryland is doing, is called Project Sidewalk. Now, um, what they're doing is also something similar, in which they're um, using crowdsourced data, uh, various accessible and inaccessible places uh, inside the city. So. Um, Let's see. So over here in product side, as you can see, you log in. And if you want to contribute, it, it opens up Google Maps. And over there, there's a short tutorial in which they kind of train you. Uh, and over there, you can see you know, the, the sidewalks or, or, or the curb stamps or whatever, curb ramps. You can, you can kind of rate them. You can, first of all, identify that such and such thing is a accessibility-related 
piece of infrastructure, and then you can rate uh, what level of accessibility it is. So over time, they're actually getting a lot of um, labeled data by humans and which they're using to train their machine learning algorithms as well. Portland, Oregon, uh, which is doing um, something called Lyft, which is a paratransit service. Um, it has some limitations. For example, you have to book um, your, your ride uh, in advance. Um, so uh, if you want to go somewhere on a bus, then you have to book your ride, then it'll come, and then you can, uh, if your wheelchair uh, is there, then you can just uh, hop onto it. In Chicago, announced that they'll add 50 wheelchair accessible uh, taxis to their fleet as well, which is great. At this point of time, I have to mention that when it comes to smart cities and when it comes to smart city technologies, um, it's just these small changes which come uh, you know, uh, from time to time which makes a city smart. One single thing or one single swoop which will make uh, a city smart. Uh, it's just these small things which add up a smart city. And when it comes to transportation, um, is wheelchair accessible cars. So we, we've, you know, in the news, we've talked about, you know, self-driving cars and things like that. But when it comes to wheelchair accessible cars, there's also uh, work being done over there. Um, uh, one of the most high profile is Chariot Solo, uh, where you can just go and um, it's, it's a single vehicle, sorry, single person vehicle, which is uh, powered by electric rather than gas. Um, and it's one of the few uh, vehicles uh, which are which is wheelchair accessible uh, and we, which allows a person on a wheelchair to drive, um, which is uh, uh, which is passed by the U.S. Uh, Transport Department. When it comes to airports uh, and making that smart, it's it's a little bit um, tricky. Uh, when it comes to wheelchair access, especially, most airports are a little bit better when it comes to that than many other buildings and establishments, simply because uh, sorry, uh, airports are designed for, for being ramp friendly because of many other factors as well. Uh, there's a lot of other things which trolleys uh, which need to be catered to, which kind of lends itself to be um, better accessible to people with wheelchairs. But one of the things that I've seen, especially in India, uh, but in general throughout uh, the air, air traffic world is the concept of silent airports. So, um, you know, in these silent airports, the, the, the trend is that basically that they won't really announce things uh, on the PA system anymore. So if you really have to pay attention to your gate, and onto the screen, which is doing the announcements uh, and listing out the flights. There's a gate change. Once again, uh, there are limited options to know about that. So in those cases, you really, really need to pay attention myself because of this. Um, so in those cases, it would be nice to have uh, a way to get a push notification or you know, or with, with a vibration alert saying that okay, such and such thing has happened. Your gate has changed, or it's time for boarding, or your plane is late, or something like this. Um, when it comes to airport kiosks, um, sign language enhancement of important videos would also be important, um, especially in a country like India, in which uh, there are multiple languages. So a person might not really be familiar with. Especially if a person is hearing impaired, they might not be familiar with any kind of written language, um, but they might be familiar with sign language. This is especially the case in India. Buses and trains. Um, over here, this is something which has been has been um, mainstream in many European uh, countries, especially. For example, in Oslo, you have a situation, or you have a uh, infrastructure and, and a setup where you can 
get the information of where your bus is right now and at what time will it arrive to your bus stop. It's a site called router.no where you can go and actually do this. But once again, um, having push notifications and vibrations uh, and allowing real-time information to arrive in the arrival time, that would be something which would be really, really great. One more thing that need, needs to be considered over here is uh, kneeling buses. And we need to push uh, the local transport de departments to, to make sure that the buses uh, is uh, as, as much as possible or as many as possible. And then expose that data uh, as well so that a person who is on a wheelchair, they might not really be interested in what's the next bus which is coming to the stop as much as they're interested in what's the next kneeling bus which is coming to the stop. That's also something which, uh, which sometimes uh, it becomes inaccessible. Um, as you can see in the, the, in, the, in the photo over here in the background photo, turnstiles are wider than the others and those are meant for you know people who who are on wheelchairs or pe people who need extra assistance to go through but oftentimes especially in a in a in a time in which there's a lot of rush hour traffic um you know and people who are able-bodied who, who can just go through the normal uh uh turnstiles they end up using this which means that the people who really need to use this people who 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 have wheelchairs are the ones which sometimes need to uh wait a little bit extra and that's bad and it's a it's a it's a frequent point of uh, frustration for many the new york times had a recent article on on the subways and about it being wheelchair accessible or not um in which they said that the New York subway system has about 500 stations, but only about 22% of NYC subways are actually wheelchair accessible. Even of those 22% of stations, sometimes uh, the elevators don't work, sometimes they're out of service, um, sometimes they're uh, just not working. Uh, even out of those 22% of the stations, many times they're not accessible, really. So these things need to be considered. And these things need to be taken in account. And these are the gaps that we're talking about. Now let's talk about telehealth and what Singapore is doing over there. Singapore identified a problem specific to their region and specific to their uh, locality, which is that Singapore has an increasingly aging population. And studies show that heart failure hit Asians about 10 years earlier than Westerners. And Indians similarly have a, uh, they have a similar risk. Thing is with heart, heart disease, it's difficult, it's costly, and it's time consuming for older and disabled people to visit the hospital regularly. And you know, in, with things like heart disease, it's a chronic lifestyle disease. Regular monitoring, it requires regular monitoring. It requires people to measure the, for example, and their weight and you know it requires generally checking up on the person and making sure that they're eating healthy they're exercising and just doing these things can make a huge difference in longevity so real-time advice and regular monitoring can make a huge difference Philips actually did a telehealth pilot program in Singapore what they did was they gave patients equipment with sensors to track the health status daily and post it to hospitals database. Uh, specialized equipment which, they, which the patient themselves used in their home uh, to monitor their blood pressure, their weight, uh, and their blood glucose levels, things like that. Information was posted daily to the hospital's database. That data was reviewed daily by a telehealth nurse. Up we used to check on them, uh, and if there was any kind of ir irregularity, and if there was any kind of signs uh, which pointed towards the need for a medical or a clinical inter intervention, they used to do that. And the result was that um, the, the, kind, the number of people who were satisfied with um, their 
their health program increased quite a lot. The number of people who said that even after the pilot program ended, they would like to continue with this, that was once again quite a lot. But this was in general about health. Um, one more in, uh, interesting thing that Singapore is doing is with uh, physical therapy. So they recently launched uh, a pilot program in which once again they, uh, they gave patients uh, a tablet and sensors. And these were patients which are older patients or patients which needed phys physiotherapy. And the tablet had an app uh, which monitors the exercises. The sensors, sen the sensors were placed on uh, uh, the, the people's arms and their uh, torsos. And the, and, and the whole idea was basically that patients can perform is, uh, in front of the tablet, which monitors uh, what they're doing with the sensors. Sessions data was sent to the physiotherapist, which was uh, back at the office. And the app also had elements of uh, gamification. For example, if, um, if, for example, needed, say 10 repetitions of an exercise, then the closer you got to the 10 uh, repetitions, the more encouragement uh, the app provided. Uh, and if someone is not pro doing the exercise properly, then the sensor sense that. For example, if the angle of movement isn't correct, then they used to you know, have audio cues saying that, okay, the angle, angle is uh, you know, not appropriate. So this, once again, is the future of healthcare where it doesn't completely eliminate the need for a hospital visit, but it makes sure that people do not need to uh, go there all the time, which makes the hesitation a little bit less. From a developing country's perspective, once again, this would be a godsend if uh, it's implemented properly in India and other developing countries. India, it's a huge, huge uh, country. There's a lot of pockets which are rural and semi-urban, uh, for example, slums. Uh, over there, sometimes uh, you do not have access to a quality medical uh, or healthcare facility for miles and miles and miles. Uh, mobile technology has grown. It's meant that even if you don't have access to a healthcare facility, you most probably do have access to your mobile phone. And over there, you have mobile data. And over there, you can actually get good medical advice uh, from a proper doctor using telehealth. It can greatly help in physiotherapy in certain cases as well. Um, even though India is a huge uh, country with a lot of youth, but by the sheer size of it, there's a lot of people who are older as well. And there's a lot of people who need uh, physical therapy. And over there, once again, can be compensated with telehealth. People who are um, hearing impaired, like India, where there's a lot of different languages and they may not be comfortable with certain language, uh, having sign language interpretation for people on live video calls can also really, really that uh, you know it's been proven time and time and again that early detection of diseases as well as disabilities can prove to be extremely crucial. Uh, in a country like India, once again, where you know, it's, it, there's a problem of having physical access to a healthcare provider, but also the fact that in many rural, semi uh areas and remote areas, a lot of superstition going on. There's still a lot of uh, misinformation going on. Sometimes when it comes to uh, or adopting medical practices, they're not really as sophisticated. And sometimes you, you find that people might even harm themselves or others by which they think is going to help them, but it's not. So having a telehealth solution over there in which a proper medical professional can come to them, even if it's a remote area, even if it's an area where um, you know, there's not a lot of education, India has one of the um, uh, infant mortality rates, one of the most highest infant mortality rates. 
um, uh, in certain states in India, it's more than Sub-Saharan Africa. So having a solution like this would be really crucial. Now let's talk about utilities. Um, till now, when it comes to utilities, it's basically been a billing only only relationship, which means that you get your bill, you just pay it, and that's the only time you really interact with your utility provider, whether it's the gas provider or the electricity provider. But nowadays, you're you're seeing more and more uh, the prevalence of smart meters. What you can do with smart meters is you can, you can have your existing gas and electricity meters sometimes um, you know uh, post data to a backend where you can see it existing meters which are not smart uh, it's very difficult to sometimes see and track uh, your consumption uh, so if a person is uh, low vision or if a person is a uh, if a person is blind they cannot really make sense of what's happening on the meter but if it's a smart meter, then data of, of what you're consuming can be posted on the back end where you can just log in uh, with your app or on, on a website and you can see how much you're consuming in real time. It's on the back end, and since it's uh, available through an app or a website, there, there are ways to make it accessible, which means people with low vision and people who are blind can really. Uh, uh, be granted access to it in a proper way. Efforts already under, underway in many countries can really save billions in costs every year. Um, the RNIB, for example, has partnered to help uh, make smart meters accessible in various parts of the UK, which is really great news. Um, and in general, when it comes to smart utilities, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Monitoring. You also have analytics. Um, so you could, in theory, see which appliance even, or which room uh, is consuming more electricity than the other. You can, of course, make it accessible. So a trend of the Internet of Things, where um, you can uh, control your lights, your fans, uh, your even your taps using a mobile app, which is great. It's great not just for people with low vision and people who are blind, but also people with motor disabilities. So you don't really need to get up from where you are and go to the place where you need to switch off your uh, light. You can just do that using your mobile app, which is great. Now, when it comes, uh, there's a lot of barriers when it comes to smart cities. Uh, I'll just list a few. Uh, one is, of course, of infrastructure. Uh, as I said, you need a good fiber optic uh, infrastructure in your city, or you need a good 4G or 3G rollout, which is robust. Then anything digital will not really work properly in the city. Sometimes there's also uh, a lack of scope. Uh, if you talk to if you talk to many local municipal people, uh, people in the local municipal department, sometimes you'll see that they're just focused on one particular thing. They're, they might be focused on, say, making buildings uh, smart, and that's it. So you know, sometimes there's a lack of people who can think about the bigger picture and how things can each other. Uh, there's also an issue of policies and laws. Um, so over there, you know, we have to work with local uh, politicians as well as local NGOs to make sure that uh, the requirements or the or or the or the local laws are actually making are making sure that people with disabilities are taken care of. And of course, there's a problem of awareness as well. Um, when people are actually coming up with smart city solutions, we need to make sure that they are aware that on an when you're making things for the city, you need to include everyone. And of course, in the end, it's all about participation and leadership. There's no one person responsible to make sure that your city that you're part of is accessible. Local municipal councils need to make sure it is making the solutions for it. And as well as citizens and NGOs, they need to keep up the pressure to make sure that any solution which is being proposed for the city, it needs to include everyone. So uh, with that, I think I'm 
I am done. So thank you so much. And if there's any questions, I would like to, to answer. Excellent. Thank you very much, Shwetang. Uh, right, let's have a look over on the Twitters. I believe there was a question. Let me just dig it out. Uh, yeah, there was a question from Priya uh, asking, are there any established standards or guidelines which ensure accessibility and inclusion in smart cities? There aren't any right now. Um, and of course, uh, when it comes to smart cities, and, uh, it's really on the on the local level that you have to see. Uh, for example, I can see, say, in India right now, then uh, the way they define smart cities is somewhat vague, and it, it's a little bit more too much on the municipal level, and more about building codes and, and things like that. Um, so. Uh, it, it's uh, right now. I, I I can't think of any a global recognized standard of smart cities and inclusion over there. Yeah, which makes sense. I mean, it, it will likely be a combination. You know, for digital things, uh, yeah. there will be aspects of WCAG that apply. But you know, if it's physical, there will be there will be different types of regulations. Yeah, I mean, there, there are different regulations for individual things, like when it comes to building codes uh, and accessibility over there, there, there are different guidelines. Um, there's no overarching guideline for smart cities and uh, you know, accessibility in, in that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, right, let's have a look. I don't think there were any more questions. Uh, so I'll take the opportunity to say thank you very much, Shwetang, for taking the time to uh, join us. And for everybody else uh, who's uh, on the stream, we're going to have a about 18 minute break. And uh, we're going to be back on the hour uh, with more accessibility and inclusive design. Thank you very much, everybody. And I hope to see you uh, later on. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.